Join over 5,000 attendees for the largest AI event in Asia at Super AI Singapore, June 5th and 6th, 2024. Rao Pal, Benedict Evans, Balaji Srinivasan, Edward Snowden, and over 150 others will join the industry's most influential to explore and unveil the next wave of transformative AI technologies. Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a week from June 3rd through June 9th with over 150 side events that will make for unparalleled networking opportunities. Visit www.realvision.com forward slash super AI for 20% off tickets with the code REALVISION or click below. Welcome to Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Thursday, February 29th, 2024. I'm Ash Bennington. Our guest today is Howard Lindzen, CEO and co-founder of StockTwits and general partner of Social Leverage. Howard, welcome back to Real Vision. Hello. Ash, so you, my man. It's great to be doing this with you, man. We, you and I have been just sitting here rapping for the last like 15 or 20 minutes about yeah. everything in the world. Where the hell do we start? Well, I'm 58 and tending to my prostate. That's what we were mostly talking about. We're, all you worry about at my age is your prostate. If you have everything's working for you, all you think about is what could happen to my prostate. And you must worry about your portfolio as well. I don't. Um, no, I do. Everybody worries about their portfolio. We're all, that's one thing everybody worries about all the time, unfortunately. Yeah. P- PSA and SPX. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, Howard, let's uh, let's get the preliminaries out of the way. Talk a little bit about what's happening in markets, and then we can go completely off the reservation when it's too late to cancel us. Uh, what do you think about what's happening? U.S. equities, uh, crypto right now is just red, red hot. What's your take on what's happening in markets more generally? Well, I think what's happening today is what happened two years ago. Uh, is no one wanted crypto? You know, you had. Again, I'm not a crypto person. I have a lot of capital, spec capital in crypto through some funds, but I remember raising money for an emerging manager fund about 18 months ago in the bottom, and we were just getting yelled out of the room. We have, you know, we were just trying to asset allocate about 18 months ago with, you know, Bitcoin around 18, 20,000. And it was, you know, I still felt we, it didn't feel like a bottom. But it just felt like based on really strong signal of no, get no after no after no being laughed out of the room for even talking about crypto. And then you had The Economist, you had every news, you had everybody was making fun of crypto that this is this is why we're at crypto today, right? You still have the same shitty global environment. You still have nobody wanted to deal with the reality of what the macro is right like the global shrinking you got a couple of wars and so the macro environment is just still conducive to a lack of trust and and then you combine all the money still sloshing around you know why would you tie your money up in venture capital when you can trade it in crypto and have a hundred backers so i can see this this whole economy of speculation is playing out again in crypto so that's the crypto market in the QQQs and the Magnificent Seven, it's just incredible companies with incredible cash flow, with incredible power, incredibly diversified uh, across consumers, across business models, across uh, jurisdiction, across currencies. And, you know, I don't know, like, that's what people are doing. They're putting their money in the Magnificent Seven. I mean, will it last? I have no idea, but I can understand why this scenario is happening. Do you worry about the narrowness of the breath? I mean, and and the degree of the run up. I mean, Nasdaq 100 trailing 12 month, basically 50 percent higher. Well, I mean, no, but yeah, I mean, de- define worry. I I don't know enough to tell people. I don't have the answers, right? Like, I think it's not as narrow as people think because Apple's a hundred companies. Um. And you can't get it out of your life. So how narrow is that really? Um, it's a narrow in the sense that you're buying one stock. But are you really buying one stock? When you buy Google, you're buying one company. You're buying a, a you know Gmail, Maps, uh, Android. 
uh, is it one company? It was one company 50 years ago before the spreadsheet. Uh, but it's a hundred companies, you know, really. So I don't know, like that narrow breadth, I don't really buy. Um, valuation, um, I guess, seems a little stretch for the shrinking world. But again, I'm not a big equity guy. You know, I take so much risk in seed stage uh, that I love watching the markets because, you know, of stock twits and I love owning individual stocks. But I've mainly become a direct indexer and ETF person. Let's just touch on the news of the day here a little bit since it's a market wrap show. We'll get on to more fun stuff in just a second. Uh, PCE increasing four tenths of 1% on the month, 2.8% year over year. Obviously, this is the indicator of inflation. The Fed watches more, uh, more most closely. This is kind of their benchmark, uh, not CPI. Uh, we should point out S&P 500, roughly um, five, call it half a percent higher for the day. Things... Uh, you know, kind of uppish to flat. NASDAQ, uh, I guess, almost up a uh, little over three quarters of one percentage point on the day. Uh, perhaps a bit of a relief rally on the notion that there's not dramatically accelerating PCE. Any thoughts about inflation? Um, no. I mean, I'm wealthy. So, like, I don't know. Like, I don't see it. Like, I can feel it. Like, people talk about McDonald's being really expensive. Um, but then I read about the app. If you use the app, it's kind of like their discount program. So I think it's real. Like I look at the prices, you know, I go to, I don't have an assistant, but I, so I book everything myself. I go to Google flights. I look at hotels, like I'm the consumer directly. I don't pass it off to anybody. So I know that hotel prices are high, especially on the luxury side. And I know, um, airline, it's more expensive to fly. Obviously it, it seems expensive, but um, I don't think of the world the way other people do because I'm not as, you know, I'm not as affected by inflation. It feels like a lot of inflation at the grocery store. And it also feels like there's a lot of inflation in um, just trying to live, like in an apartment on the coast. You got to sign your life away. Like I have a young daughter and I have all their friends trying to get apartments. You can't, you have to put up your, your left a kidney to you can't put up your left kidney you have to sign your life away and they don't want to rent you an apartment so it's it's harder to live if you, you don't have to put have up money. your if you're in your 20s you have to put up your parents left kidney yeah you're right it's your parents so i'm like signing for friends apartments and friends of friends but it, it's it's so it's i think living is harder as a young person i, I don't know about inflation but i can't imagine when i was starting out in life it just wasn't this hard you had a you had a credit card and you had Best Buy and you just lay you just ran up a bill and worried about it later. Kids today are on debit cards and it just seems more stressful. Yeah, extremely extremely well said. And you you see the goods and services inflation uh, and the dramatically outstripped by the asset price inflation. You talk about folks in their twenties who are trying to start households, start families. It's brutal, man. It's brutal, it's brutal. To get out there in the first house. Because I shop for myself. We, I live part-time in Coronado, so I walk to the grocery store and I grab stuff for a week. And I just no prices because I have to just notice that paper towel is ridiculously expensive. Like, I always remember my wife saying, why are you using paper towel? You could wipe it with a cloth. I'm like, come on. And now that I pay for paper towel myself, I go, what am I doing? Paper towel is crazy. I just tweet. I don't know what it is with paper towels, but I just tweeted about the thirty dollars bounty purchase I just made. Right, it's Double bananas. Months. It's crazy. Yeah, it's bananas. I'm just going to use underwear before I wash it. Probably be cheaper. That's a tip. That little tip for free on a stock show. <laughs> hey, let me ask you this: <laughs> something you said when we were talking a little bit about crypto. When you compared crypto to VC investment, I talk a little bit about uh, that trajectory. You see, obviously, instant liquidity. I guess that's a blessing and a curse. But do you see uh, in the future? things moving toward a more uh, sort of fully fungible, digitized VC space? And what, what happens to the folks out on Sand Hill Road? That's a lot to unpack. So as a seed investor for the last 20 years, um, I'm in this period where I can't stand venture capitalists because I don't trust the stack above me, right? Even if I make a great investment at the seed level, I based on SoftBank and Amazon and all this money above me, I have to now just make sure not that my first investment is good, but some drunk late stage venture capitalist who has different goals 
than the founder and me doesn't wreck a cap table. That was in during Zerp, no one cared about anything, right? So bad behavior, be damned. Paul Graham's a genius. Uh, he's not. He's also an anti Semite. But I'm saying, like, there was all this Zerp uh, nonsense where we could get away with mistakes. And now everybody was think, a genius. You're right. Yeah. Everybody was a genius, including myself. But I'm saying, in hindsight, you were you were an idiot if you didn't make money. So let's just be honest about that. So now that this the tide has wiped out a little bit and crypto is not going away, I don't know about whether it's Sandhill, but I know that BC is going to change, right? And the way social leverage our firm deals with it is we want our companies to be cash flow sooner, like business first. They don't have to think about being a unicorn. And don't trust the capital stack. Don't trust the next. Assume you're going to raise less money and build to a two to $300 million exit versus thinking about a billion dollar exit because there is no such thing as a unicorn. That was like a moment in time. And those moments in times come back, but they look different when they come back. And we can see it in crypto. They came back right away. Well, every VC is still out there raising money. And so what we learned is the crypto people that survived learned how to trade through a crash and now they're smarter. Um, So that game continues and the VC game is changing more. Does the VC game turn to blockchain? No, I just think companies raise less money because VCs are kind of useless. I love it. Let's start Go ahead. Doug. But VCs that invest in true venture capital are necessary, right? Robots, and but a VC creating an app or a VC, you know, disrupting enterprise, you know, all the rages of the last, you know, the Uber of this and the this and that, you know, venture capital is supposed to be venture capital, right? Like we see it in the chip industry, right? Like, I mean, we need venture capital. We just don't need it where we thought we needed it. Uh, that's that that's so interesting. So you're talking about really um you know long time horizon capital intensive uh manufacturing. I mean there's just there's just no way that you're uh, going to crowdsource uh, the, the latest uh silicon uh factory, yep. right? It's fabrication yep. is too damn expensive. Yeah. So we went through this period of misallocation of capital to get better allocated. So I think VC is going to change. I don't think it means it's going to the blockchain. Well, you get to look at things really early as a seed stage investor. Let's talk a little bit about that. What do you see? What's changed uh, here in the wake uh, of this period that we've just passed out of that we've been talking about with massive central bank liquidity beginning to ease off? Well, there's still capital out there. So what's different this time is we're starting from a higher base of capital. Uh, We're starting with more people on the platform of investing uh, because there's so many mentors and places like Real Vision and StockTwits and Reddit and Twitter and Discord. You, you have so many mentorship possibilities, right? So, so, so everybody's leveled up. Plus, there's more money in the system, and uh, you know, so so it's you know, for me, C stage investing is about where, like, really, how do you fit in? Like, when you, how do you think about companies getting built, and then really trying to find some big trends because if you find bigger trends, it doesn't matter the size of the company. And then there's just all kinds of exit and optionality possibilities. So, so as a seed investor, we went from an abundant uh, period of, uh, even if you don't execute, you can, your engineers can go hang their hat at Google and Amazon and Facebook to this environment of AI. Well, that ain't possible anymore, right? Like no one wants an engineer unless they're a 10 times engineer. So, so as a seed stage investor, the level set for us was we had to rethink how we build companies and how, what kind of founders we're looking for and what kind of sectors are. So it's just completely changed. I, I believe the seed stage business has completely changed. And the basic premise is less capital, get to a business first and stack the tech later. Like once you have a business and a little bit of a moat, you can, you have way more optionality to stack the tech in your favor and expand to another region. We went through a ZERP period, whereas like if you had product market fit, you would global domination the first day, right? right. VCs would, because of ZERP, it's like, does it really make sense that 
Robinhood as an investor tried to get into China in year three because Uber did it. You know, the playbook before Uber and Web 2 was like, don't even think about China till year 10. And in Web 2, it was like year three, let's go into China and we'll win. Like, does that sound realistic anymore? No. And it was so that thinking has got to be completely changed. So let's talk about that. What type of investors are you looking? Excuse me. What type of founders are you looking at now as an investor? Well, the good news is we have a huge network. For, you know, I write, you know, I have stock twits. You know, we put the vibe out there, I would say, about what we're looking for. So it's mostly inbound, right? Um, we've been doing this for 20 years, so that's an edge. We, we, I tell people what we're looking for, just like I'm doing right now, right? Um, and so what we're looking for are founders that would be happy with a $300 million exit. So if you're happy with a $300 million exit, you know, paid in capital should be at most $30 million. So let's have a conversation. If you think you can build a $300 million company on $30 million of capital. And right. And then by the way, back, take it backwards. What does a $300 million company look like in a 5% interest world? It doesn't look like $3 million in sales and a million dollar a month burn. It looks yeah. more like 30 million in sales and profitable. Right. And so if you tell that story enough, first of all, every founder doesn't want to talk to me when they hear that story, but eventually founders that understand how we think call us and say, we get you, here's our idea. And then it's just much easier. So we're still in that period of like romance and dating where we're telling people what the world looks like or how social leverage thinks, uh, exits look like. And then we're trying to find founders and then form fit companies to build to that exit so that our LPs make money. We have like, we're on the same level when we invest and then we can work the cap table towards like a right, you know, a rightful, you know, exit. So how you structure the cap table at the beginning really change. It really is the most important part. Uh, we were talking uh, before we went live uh, about the way commerce itself is being restructured the nature of disintermediation, how digital content uh, is coming of age in a way that allows creators, that allows entrepreneurs to directly monetize, own the relationships with the customers in ways that they never have before. We were paying homage to the great Richard Lewis uh, a few minutes before we went live. Uh, and we were talking about, uh, about Punch Up, something that you've invested in. And it's interesting to me in of itself, because I love comedy, but also because it's in some ways emblematic of a shift where you see this balance changing, uh, where folks can own relationships directly with their customers without layers and layers of middlemen, not just stepping on margins, but even perhaps more important, disintermediating the direct relationship that people can have with technology, which I think is just a fascinating idea. So uh, it's a good example because no one's heard of it yet, but they will. And Joe Rogan just mentioned it. So comedy, not a venture industry forever. Believe me, I put uh, I've made a few $25,000 investments because of, as a passionate uh, want to be funny person. <clears throat> so, because what? For the last 15 years, comedians and entertainers and so forth and us and influencers have been said, go online, you know, start a Facebook account, start a Twitter account, start an Instagram account. And by golly, that was fun for a lot of people. But in the end, who's famous? Elon Musk, um, Donald Trump, uh, Kim Kardashian, they were going to be famous either way, right? So if we really think about it, who's famous, uh, the guy on YouTube, Mr. Beast. Okay. We did all this to get Mr. Beast famous. Okay. So obviously there's a lot more famous people than Mr. Beast down on, down in the trend line. All those people either are going to get screwed or have been screwed by the man, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. I'm rate limited or shadow banned on Twitter. I don't know why, but who cares? It's my fault for, for not, for me being the product. Okay. So along comes crypto after 10 years of social media, and that's not believing owning our own uh, customer mattered. Along comes crypto. Everybody's like, that's the golden goose, right? That's going to disrupt everything. Well, guess what? There's this old tool, this old pipe that everybody forgot about called email which is pretty damn not broken, pretty damn good, right? Like, yeah, there's deliverability issues and you got to be careful, but you own that. If you have a subscriber on email, you can email them, right? It may or may not get through, but with Gmail and with Outlook, with, the, with spam detection, with et cetera, and deliverability by the email providers, 
it gets through, right? If it's meant to get through, it gets through. Okay. So instead of crypto, the head fake, and instead of social media, email is the killer, the killer um, tool for entertainer, right? Because a comedian on YouTube can get banned for a joke, right? And his 200,000 subscribers, he doesn't have, he doesn't know how to contact them. So along comes, you know, a, a, a kid, Daniel Frank, not a kid. And he'd been at Facebook for 13 years, a product guy. And he, and he realized by talking to comedians and entertainers for 10 years at Facebook, they're getting screwed and they really need to talk to their customers directly. Um, and, and so a few comedians, you know, started doing it. And in the last four or five months, hundreds of comedians have started doing because they talk amongst themselves and um, very non-scalable idea. But now the best comedians in the world realize that by owning their own email, they can drive ticket sales and see direct results. So the whole flip that has been promised by venture capitalists and Facebook and then by crypto was really just about email, right? And it couldn't be easier. Everybody knows email. It was just forgotten on the shelf because everybody was chasing likes and retweets. And here we are back to what's old as new. 20 years later, like you said, Sam Morrell, right, can fill a stadium from his email list. Now, who has the power now with tickets, right? Sam Morrell. And maybe Sam Morrell now can lend his email list instead of his sending a tweet to a comic that he loves in Des Moines, Iowa, because he knows he has 1600 people that will open his email in Des Moines. And so he can promise that comic that 1600 people that love Sam Morrell will probably would show up for his event. So again, it's, we're, we're flipping kind of the power and it isn't a new tool. It's kind of an old tool. What's new about it is the company punch up won't need to raise a hundred million dollars. So it's not exciting to a venture capitalist. But punch up could be profitable in its first year. Oh, and by the way, he didn't have to get an article on TechCrunch. Joe Rogan had Sam Morell on his podcast, and Sam Morell was just in the course of, how, yeah, how do we find you? Sam Morell goes, I'm using this incredible, simple tool called Punch Up. And Joe Rogan looks at him and goes, That's genius. And how do you buy that press? So we, we have two things going on. You have to have a leaner cap table. You have to have a business model that makes sense. And then you have to find a different hack to growth. And if you do those, you're still going to get rich as an entrepreneur in America. You know who's not going to get rich? The venture capitalists. And that's the only thing that's changing the way I see it right now. That's the big unlock. And so I think the big unlock is not that venture capital is going away. It's just really going to be different. Gosh, that is so fascinating because it it just it harkens back to some just kind of core fundamentals that seemed completely out of whack for so long, right? We were in this ZERP period where everyone was just chasing, as you point out, this this massive unlimited scale, right? I want three million likes. That's my goal. I want three million likes. I don't want to build a small business uh, where we can make some reasonable profit, control costs, run a business like you know in a way that actually made sense uh, based on fundamentals. The other fascinating thing that go ahead, jump in. Well, capacity constraint, right? There's a, these are old terms, right? Like what makes social leverage? We're not geniuses, but we run a very limited size fund. So the, cap, the capital constraint is the edge, right? Like that's hard, but it's also how you win, right? You have to fight in a weight class. Like the best, the best people stay in a weight class, right? Fred Wilson always kept his funds under $150 million, right? Like Andreessen has a different game, right? They're playing a different ball game. They're playing a media and asset game, right? The returns don't matter. So as long as everybody knows what game everybody's playing, that's fine. But it's up to the investor to know which game they're in. And right. as an investor, I want to play in one game. I set the rules. I'm going to be wrong all the time. That, that doesn't change. I'm going to be wrong all the time. But when I'm right, it's so much more fulfilling knowing that we 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 did the deal this way and it's something like the plan worked and, and I see, and it's fun to do that right from the start. So, you know, the game changed, um, or the, but the rules really are the same. It's just ZERP and w the cloud and the mobile phone. It was such a euphoric moment in tech, in, in tech combustion and explosion of opportunity that of course we all got caught up in. It was a magical 10 year period of, of capital abundance and tech abundance and 
and global markets were open to everyone. Of course that happened. But you, it's not because you were smart. You just happened to be alive during one of the greatest floods of opportunity of all time. But what's so interesting about that is that even though this irrational exuberance period has passed, the ZERP era has passed, the infrastructure that was created during that period is now laying the groundwork for the generation of fundamentals-based businesses that are going to come after it. And the paradigm has shifted into this new digital space. Wasn't it irrational exuberance? I don't think it was the same. It was irrational stupidity and mentoring by, I mean, why common air is Harvard? It just was a sped up Harvard, right? They've been spitting out bullshit rules that the founder gets 50%. You got to do a, a note. Sorry, like they just were a fast Harvard, right? Like the model was great. He, it was great for Y Commoner. They run the table, they become an ETF, uh, they control market returns at a seed stage invest. You can't blame Paul Graham for playing that game. That's a fucking good game. But that game isn't good for everybody else. You know, returns need to be returned to the LPs. In the end, the LPs decide who keeps playing. Right. And if you want to be in the game of returning capital to your LPs, you can't just follow everybody into the bright, shiny objects. You have to understand how the game works. They, Y Carmener had a great game for that era. Okay. I don't think that same game will work now. And we'll see. We'll check back in 10 years and we'll see the returns of like people that understood the changes in the mar market dynamics. Uh, doesn't mean Paul Graham's not going to continue to hoard capital to himself, but I don't think the returns will stay the same. I want to get at least one question in from our viewers here, and this is a great one. It comes just from one of our regular viewers, Ralph Humphrey from the Real Vision website, uh, who wants to know, Howard, what are the common themes among seed stage companies that fail versus seed stage companies that make it? Well, again, good question. Define seed stage. Seed stage like was so abused as a term, right? There were seed stage deals when I started, you know, with stock twits, we raised at a six hundred thousand dollar valuation. And you know, by two thousand, even today, crypto deals are forty million, no product valuation. So define seed stage. Like I mean, it's like saying what a what a valuation of a growth stock is anymore. So so that's part of the problem with define seed stage. To me, seed how, how stage. How do you define? Yeah. Yeah. So to me, seed stage today that we call it, and it's the same as always, show me a product. Like, I don't want to see a drawing. I want to be able to play with the product because I'm not smart enough. Again, to me, it means I got to be able to touch and feel the product. Uh, and it needs to have one customer. It may not be a paying customer, but it needs to have a customer because I'm not smart enough. Okay. And then the next thing is, the most important thing at seed stage that people forgot is how do I get out, right? Assuming everything goes right, how do I get out? So that goes to the paid in capital versus the exit expectation, you know, for $300 million company, just old rules, 30 million of capital in. But for me, seed stage is if I'm going to take the risk at a seed stage, it's the company's next round needs to be five or six times higher than what I'm doing. So if I'm going to do a seed stage company at a 20 to $40 million valuation, which sounds absurd just to you on paper, just me telling you this out loud, um, then the company realistic to get venture returns, the next round's got to be at a 240 million valuation. People were still writing these checks up and they're still writing these checks. So I talked to founders and go, if we're going to invest at a 4 million valuation, which sounds ridiculously low to you. The next round needs to be a 20 million or my, we're never going to get the returns for our LPs. So I'd be working for free. So unless investors start behaving smarter, the returns are not going to be there for their LPs. It's just my concern, right? Everybody can keep writing checks and the party can go on. But at some point, someone's going to say, don't I get capital back? And that's probably why crypto is working and the stock market's working and venture's still in some shitty period because no one's gotten the message or because the money was raised and not deployed yet, right? Like if you're, if you're benchmark, your money's raised, you don't even have to market. So, but, so the game's still going on, but yet the, the people are over, over have moved. So those, th that's not, probably not a great answer, but that's how I see it. You know, the other thing I think that's really interesting, and I think, frankly, a little bit inspiring here, uh, is that the world that you're talking about is not just a winner-take-all world, where there are yeah. six or seven platforms that dominate everything. It's almost like a, it almost kind of pulls us back to, a, you know, like the, the vaudeville era, right? So there's, you know, every, you don't have television, every town, you got to go out, you got to have a singer, you got to have a dance troupe, you got to have an acting troupe. And this idea that you can kind of find ways to directly monetize mid-tier players 
who can go on, build businesses, create content, do with it their things. I mean, that is a, a world that looks a lot more uh, democratic fun. and yeah, and fun. fun. Right? Like there's no running the table. Why is that important? Why is global domination important? What has that gotten anybody? The art of winning can be at many different styles of winning. And that's what technology is supposed to bring, an abundance for more. So we need smarter investors managing expectations. By the way, it's great that the Magnificent Seven exists with cash because at some point they're going to have to buy companies again because they're up here and, and they're so far away from the ground level. So this has never been a better time to start a business, but start a fucking business. Just don't start a company, start a business. And um, if those people that get the messages are going to have a hell of a great 10 years here. And there's going to be a hell of a lot of buyers at two to $500 million if you build a profitable business. So that's kind of what we're telling founders. Well, I couldn't think of a better place to end than on that note, uh, fun and uh, optimism. Final thoughts, key takeaways, Howard, that you'd like to leave our viewers and our listeners with? Uh, you know, uh, it's a short, we were talking about it. Life is short, right? So... I try and, you know, I'm getting to the edge where I read uh, headlines of people that I like dying. And so trust me, you, you live. Uh, it's not so bad to just try and live. So, you know, we're trying, trying to try and uh, do stuff that like you like to do and do more of that. And you, you know, build domain expert experience and, and, and kind of like try and enjoy your life. Perfect note. Howard, let's have you back on for a longer conversation. We'll unshackle us from market wrap conversation. Talk about the broader economy. Talk about life. Really wonderful stuff. Thanks so much for joining us, Howard Lindzen. Thanks. Thank you all so much for watching and for listening to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Remember, if you want access to research from the pros, head over to realvision.com forward slash RV Marketplace. That's realvision.com slash RV Marketplace to see what RV member discounts are available. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Same time, same place. See you all then. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Join over 5,000 attendees for the largest AI event in Asia at Super AI Singapore, June 5th and 6th, 2024. Raul Powell, Benedict Evans, Balaji Srinivasan, Edward Snowden, and over 150 others will join the industry's most influential to explore and unveil the next wave of transformative AI technologies. Singapore will become a vibrant AI hub for a week from June 3rd through June 9th with over 150 side events that will make for unparalleled networking opportunities. Visit www.realvision.com forward slash super AI for 20% off tickets with the code realvision or click below.